for James 5. And when I read this the first time, I was looking at this, this um, there's a lot of really, really good stuff in here. So, um, uh, again, hopefully we'll, we'll have some good stuff out of this. So it's very powerful, and um, there's kind of two primary uh, considerations or topics, if you will. The first deals with money, wealth, which is in verse 1 through 6. Um, the verses are probably directed at believers, uh, non-believers, but however, the, the words that he, that he gives, that James gives, can be used as a reminder uh, and encouragement to uh, believers as well on putting your trust in wealth and, and or frankly, what happens if you, if you do put your trust in wealth. The second is directed at believers and primarily deals with um, how you walk with a consistent faith um, and patience in view of the Lord's return um, and marking the end of the world system. Um, the verses, all of them, the whole chapter, it's an it's uh, uh, exhortation um, to believers to walk out our faith. <clears throat> Verse 1 through 6, what I'll read here in a second, is, is a kind of titled, The Plight and Life of a Man Who Puts Their Trust in Riches. Verse 1, Come now, you rich, weep, and howl, for your miseries are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corrupted, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasures in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, who kept back, you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Um, as I mentioned in my opening, James is, is probably addressing uh, non-believers here. Um, he opens, and he's not referring to those he's speaking to as um, brethren, whereas when we get down to verse 7, he starts out by saying brethren, and also if you look back in 4.11, he's addressing the, the brethren, so I think there's a, a, a split here on, on who he's, he's talking about. Um, in either case, he was speaking to Christians, he was for sure not speaking to Christians that were walking strong in their faith. Rather, they were probably carnal, backslidden, um, frankly, living for themselves, and they weren't spirit-controlled uh, believers. So regardless of if this is to believers or non-believers, um, it can be an encouragement to us uh, as we view um, James's words on riches. Notice in verse 1, it, uh, James is not offering a uh, call to repentance, um, so the end may be changed. The end is already, for, for these people that he's speaking to, has already been determined. His words speak to the anguish of a certain coming of events of loss and retribution. <clears throat> I think James understood, just as we do today, that wealth and things make it difficult to see a need for God. In Matthew 19, 24, we are reminded, And I say again to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So I've, not, I've seen a needle, I've seen a camel, two don't mix. Um, and I think he's just trying to make a very, very strong case that just doesn't happen. Um, if you're wealthy, you might not tend to think you need God. You've got wealth, so it's security. You've got wealth, it can buy you pleasure. You've got wealth, it can buy you things. Um, in some regards, it can even buy you health because you can see the, the greatest doctors and get your body taken care of. Um, so there, there's a perception there that maybe you, don't, maybe you don't really need God. And the miseries to come are certain because in James, uh, in, in verses 2 and 3, he uses the verb there in the past tense. He says, your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, and he says, your gold and your silver are corroded. Literally, what they have put their trust in and their faith in, it's rotted. Their garments are moth-eaten, their gold and silver is tarnished. Things, 
things tend to bring a, a, a diminishing level of satisfaction. You buy a new car, it's awesome as long as the new car smell is in there. What's it last? A month, two months? Unless you've got a buddy that wants to try and light up in there, then it lasts for about, it lasts for about two minutes. So, um, But it doesn't last very long, right? Um, your car is, you want to wax it that first time. You want to watch it. So first time it gets a ding on it, it gets a ding and it's like, First, you're probably all frustrated and upset because you've got this expensive car with a ding on it, and then it gets the second ding, and at that point, it's like, yeah, it's a beater. Um, so, um, and what, what I have found, too, is sometimes you have to amass a collection of things because having one of something is fun, gives you satisfaction. One doesn't work. Now you need two. Then you need five. Then you need ten. And at some point, even that, even that doesn't work. I think there's a saying, it's how many, you know, you, they were asking a wealthy person, how many more dollars do they need? And it, they I think it was just, I just need one more. <clears throat> so apart from God, all wealth and its satisfaction will perish. It may leave us quickly or slowly, but we can be certain eventually it will, it will fail, and the joy and satisfaction to any, who put, to, to any who put their hope in it. Our hope is in the Lord. It's not in things. Um, and an important distinction needs to be made here. Scripture does not um, denounce wealth um, or riches or the rich. Um, when they're talked in negative terms, uh, they're talked in negative terms and announced from the standpoint of, of a person yielding to the temptation which can come with great riches or putting your trust in those riches. Um, so the question is, where are we, where are our people putting their trust? If it's in anything but God, it's a bad answer. Even if it's a good answer, it's a bad answer. At the end of the day, it comes down to your heart. The Lord says, the love of money is the root of all evil. I know often we hear this wrong, that, that money is the root of all evil. Two things are, are different in Scripture. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many arrows. The word there, pierced, kind of jumped out at me. It's not like we're being beaten, bruised, and, and everything. It's like you've been in a knife fight, right? I can take a beating, maybe, but I can't take too many piercings. So it's, it's, they're trying to, trying to be pretty um, dramatic with the words that he's using. So if a man lays up treasure, or a man will lay up treasure, either in this life or the next, it's a matter of choice. Sadly, the, uh, the men that James is speaking of, um, their wealth will only last long enough to judge them. Matthew 6, 19 through, or 6, 19 through 21, reminds us that we should not lay up treasures, our treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then Paul also wrote, about the judgment coming, um, which will clearly demonstrate that anything that we've built for this time won't last, um, but those that we built for eternity will last. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15 says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's works in what sort it is. If anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If, every, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. One of the things that, that kind of popped out to me here is it, it almost reads or does kind of read, it says if you build it on gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, it doesn't make a distinction about building it on good stuff 
and building on all bad stuff because I look at hay and I'm like, of course hay's garbage and it's gonna burn up. Of course hay's, or of course straw's garbage and it's gonna burn up. But my gosh, if you build something with gold, that's amazing, that should last, that's awesome. Well, scripture says right here, and they're equating them all, all to be the same, um, that if they were laid down for wrong purposes, wrong reasons, they all get burned up. So in thinking on verse four, um, it's clear where the rich have placed their trust. Their lust was so great that they held back the rightful pay from men who actually had helped them to increase their worth, their, their, um, their workers. Even though we're talking about a Jewish society, this was part of the law given to them in Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15, and Malachi 3 and 5, it talks about the rules in, in, of engagement and how they're not to hold money back from their workers. So while they knew it, they still chose to, to, to just basically steal. It is, um, and then if you read too, both the wages and the worker who are crying out to God, both heard, both were heard by God's ear. Um, and it should be encouragement to us that nothing misses uh, the eyes nor the ears of God. Don't worry, he sees. The character and activity of the wealthy who are ungodly can generally be described in four terms. They hoard, they cheat, they're self-extravagant, and they like to oppress. Amos 6, 1 through 6, goes on to describe this type of behavior in even further terms, with verse 1 starting out by saying, Woe to you at ease. And then goes on to say in the following verses 4 to 6, Who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out, your, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to sound the, to the sound of string instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David, who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourselves with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. So they were enjoying the good life. They were taking care of themselves, and that's all they were concerned about. Um, it didn't matter to them. Others were suffering. Others were in need. Um, they were in it for me, which kind of sounds like today's society, right? You walk around, it's what's in it for me. How can, I get, how can I get more? How can I get better things? How does it work better for me? Even if you want to help somebody, it's sometimes it's like, well, I'll help you because if I help you, I know you'll help me. And what you're going to help me with, I can't do. And it's going to be better for me if I, it's, it's, it's a game. And then in 2 Timothy 3, 3, 1 through 3, we see that, that the last days are also filled with this type of behavior. But you know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, and despisers of good. So you look around in your society, or our society, and, you know, everybody's talking bad about somebody instead of lifting them up. Um, you know, we have uh, people killing each other all over the place. Um, pretty unloving, I would say. You know, it's not, your life doesn't matter, right? And that's, that's, that's what we're hearing here. It's a brutal society. And as Christians, these verses should remind us of the stark contrast between the ways of God and the ways of the world in areas of our personal desires, relationship, plans, and wealth. We should be the opposite of what I read is coming in end times. We should be loving. We should be forgiving. We should be encouraging. We should show self-control. And it says, despisers of good, we should love good. Um, we want to encourage good. Suffice it to say, if God is not preeminent and he's and not in control of our life, then we can expect man's worst qualities 
and actions to emerge. You look at our schools. I mean, people argue about it, but I would venture if you looked at research, take prayer, Bible, et cetera, et cetera, out of public school, morality went down, grades went down, and they keep saying, we'll just throw more money at it. We'll throw more money at it. We'll throw more money at it. Money doesn't fix everything. Matter of fact, it may break it. Um, so we're... I don't know where we rank anymore, didn't have time to look at that, but we used to be really high on the totem pole with mathematics and science and things like that. No longer, you know, we're going abroad to bring people over because we, we can't do the things, we can't think ourselves out of a box sometimes. That's, that's kind of where we've gotten ourselves. The righteous man should look uh, patiently to the future days as we will see, starting in the next verse, verse 7. And these verses are introduction to patience. This is the second theme that I had spoken of earlier. Verse 7, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard of the pers per perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So first we're exhorted um, to, to remain patient. In verse 7, um, is connected to what we had learned in verse 1 through 6, which was talking about the oppressive wealthy. Um, don't get sad, don't get depressed, don't get discouraged when you look around sometimes and say, wow, the ungodly have it made, they're having all the fun, you don't see them go to bed at night. Sometimes it's hard to sleep. So, um, so you keep doing what you're doing. You do the right thing. You be patient. You endure. You live a life of holiness, um, entrusted to God, walking in his ways, and God will take care of others. It's not our job. Regardless of present circumstances, we as believers must remember things will not always continue as they are. Being patient is more than just a brave endurance. It also speaks to a restraint that allows one suffering to hold back from retaliation. Sometimes we want to take matters into our own hands. We're told not to do that. Why? Verse 12, Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It's his job, not ours. The patience and long-suffering is sometimes, is sometimes translated to be the opposite of anger and is associated with the mercy and used of God himself. God is merciful, God is kind. Romans 2.4 says this, Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance? The power to exercise the patience is available to those who are able to submit to the power of the Holy Spirit. So in our own power, we can only do, in our own power, we can modify our, our behavior on some level, but I think it goes deeper than that. We don't want a behavior change, we want a heart change. And um, to be good, um, to have forbearance, to be long-suffering with our family, with friends, and quite honestly, the unbelievers out there that we may be looking at and saying, well, why don't you do it this way and you know what's right? Maybe they don't. They're unbelievers. I have to remind myself of that sometimes when I just want to bip somebody upside the head, that I need to bip myself upside the head because I walked in their shoes, and frankly, there are some days where I look to wander in their shoes 
only to be reminded, Lord, sorry, and, and regain my path. We're reminded, too, of uh, the, one of the, uh, a fruit of the Spirit is patience and long-suffering. Galatians 5, verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Our hope should be set on the time that the Lord will appear, and He will set things right. And again... In this chapter, James was saying that the, that the wealthy were stealing, they were being oppressive, they weren't giving the workers their just due. It's again a reminder, those things will be set right. So an example or an illustration in, um, in patience is the farmer. Um, and he used this because he knew James knew that in that time, agriculture was where it was at. Everybody understood. You planted, you reaped, um, and the rains are what sustained your life. There was a period of about four months um, between the sowing and the reaping. It could be a stressful time. You plant and go to all that trouble to buy seed, plant seed, and then you're waiting for rain. You get no rain. What gives? Oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. <clears throat> the farmer, he needed the early rains to come to germinate the seed. And that would start the um, production of whatever he had planted early on. But he wasn't done. He also needed the latter rain to come shortly before harvest, allowing the crop to reach proper maturation. If you got the early rains, you get a little seedling, it comes up, sun, it may die. So you want your fruit to fatten up. So you need rains in the middle as well. The lack of either would bring loss of hope to the farmer, um, and there would be no productivity. The farmer's patient was, patience was one of confident expectancy in the faithfulness of God. Like the farmer, we too should be... Um, confident in waiting for the Lord to provide. We can rest in assurance that what the Lord has be, uh, begun in us will be brought to completion. Philippians 4, 1 through 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus promised the followers he would come again. If you promised them, he's promising us that where he is, we may be also. John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be discouraged. Because we know we believe in God, believe also in me. God speaking. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. With this hope before us, if it was truly before us every day, and we saw it like it was a reality, and I'm speaking to myself as I say this, um, you would think that maybe we would walk a little bit differently, um, talk a little bit differently, feel a little bit different, because we know we win. We know we get the prize. We know we get to spend eternity in heaven with God who saved us from death. Um, but I don't know that we always, me, I don't always get that sometimes. The believer should strengthen himself, establishing his whole being in the assurance of hope of the Lord's return. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of the Lord Jesus at his coming? We may tend to lose hope as we might think the Lord's return is delayed. He's taken the time he needs to take. It's not delayed. Jesus reminds us that the Lord's coming, it's drawing near and it's close at hand. There's a couple of scriptures that say that. Mark 115, 
and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious, watchful in your prayers. As Christians, and this is a big thing, as Christians, we should remember that his return will bring judgment for some and release for others and should give us cause for patience. I'll give a scripture on that for a second. Him coming is great for me, but as there's other people wandering around out there that don't know Jesus, that's complete loss and destruction and the end of day for them. Should be reminded on that on two fronts. And it's kind of odd. We're, we're praying for God to come back soon. We should do that. But on the other side of that coin, there's those that are still out there that need to, to, to come into the fold. So it's kind of a catch-22, but we're told to do it. But I think as we're praying for the Lord's return, I think we should keep in the back of our mind that he's waiting, maybe waiting, because there's that one more, that, that lost sheep that he needs to go and find. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but as long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's taking his time. So he's in, taking the time that he needs. He doesn't want anybody to um, perish. And that should be an, a reminder to us as well to be busy. Um, I don't know that I, frankly, every day when I'm walking around I'm dwelling on the fact that there's people that I'm walking next to or I see walking past me that they're on a different path than me. Am I really concerned? Do I care that they're going to hell? That should move us to compassion, move us to, to be long-suffering and be okay with the Lord tarrying for however long he tarries while we have an opportunity to, to um, introduce people to him. There are some good examples of patience. Prophets. <laughs> Even in the midst of, of suffering, um, or as they're telling the people things, um, God wanted them to hear. They were, they were, being, <laughs> they were being beat up and, and persecuted. Um, Stephen, right? This not a prophet, but Stephen, just for talking about the prophets in Acts 7 as part of his sermon. He's like, haven't you, haven't you, you know, you persecuted the prophets, and for that, they stoned Stephen. It should cause us to remember Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they executed the prophets who are before you. Sometimes I think if we fit in perfectly everywhere we go, we should fit in here, right? But if you're out in the world and you fit in perfectly and you're buddy-buddy with everybody and everybody loves you and everybody thinks you're great, you might want to ask why that is. Because there should, we should be causing some friction out there. Um, not in a mean way, not in an ugly way. We're not going to jump up. We're not going to jump up on our desk and look at our boss and say, you're going to hell. That won't work. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's when the Holy Spirit will lead you. You'll have opportunities, and you'll know when those opportunities are. And frankly, just by walking around and not swearing may cause people to ask a, a question. Um, I don't know if I shared this in here. I know if I shared it with a couple folks, but for me personally, I had a mouth like a sailor at, at, at before I became a Christian. That was my thing. Um, there were a couple things I didn't say, but everything else, it's all good. Um, and I became a Christian, and then I noticed for me, um, I had hurt myself out in the yard, and not only did nothing come out of my mouth, but I didn't have anything here. It was like, oh, oh shucks, or something like that. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, but that was just for me. But I was driving down to uh, a seminar with a buddy, a CEO at a company of, that I had worked for, 
and he was carrying on and talking about this and talking about that and every other word was a curse word or whatever and about three hours into our conversation he looked at me and says you don't talk the same you don't cuss anymore why are you not talking does it bother you that I'm talking this way and I'm like dude I don't really love it but it doesn't bother me that's for you and I said thanks for noticing it's not me it's God um, and I got an opportunity to share with him just because he saw that there was something different. That's the kind of thing that as we walk in work that unbelievers should see. We'll talk here in a bit about our yes being yes and no being no, same thing. If we tell somebody yes, it should be yes. If we tell somebody no, it should be no. And it shouldn't be all wishy-washy and they should know us by that. If they come to us and we tell them yes, they can, they can bet on that. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. The world might say yes, and if it doesn't work out for them, or at least this is the way it should be, if we say yes, it should be. An unbeliever might say yes, and then who knows, right? If something works out better for them, maybe they, maybe, maybe they buddy jump. Another example is Job. If you're in, in verse 11 of James, he uses Job as a specific example when talking about patience. We won't read the story of Job because all of us in here have probably heard that, but he lost everything. He lost his wealth, he lost his family, he lost his health, he lost the comfort of his wife, and he lost the trust of his so-called friends. Um, and I say so-called friends because they weren't very helpful at the end. The good news, as we know the end of the story, is everything that Job lost was restored. The end of Job 12:42 says, "Now the Lord blessed Job, or no, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning." Job, and by extension, we can know the Lord's compassion and His mercy. Don't remember the verse, but it's for our good, right? So the enemy might think, "Ah, I'll wear you out. I'll put some bad stuff there." Even that can be used for for. Uh, for good. James 5.11 Indeed we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job apparently never found out why he suffered. So it makes one wonder. Is it possible that the Lord brings us through suffering not for our own patience uh, to be strengthened, but that our experience may be instructive and an illustration to others who may observe our life. So it'd be kind of funny if we could have been there assuming this is true, because I don't ever remember anybody saying, Job, this is why, son. Job gets to heaven and the Lord says, hey, guess what? I wrote about you in my book. And there's a Bible study going on on the 12th, and guess what they're talking about? Or they're going to talk about? They're going to talk about you. You're going to be, you're going to be example for patience, right? Patience of Job, patience of Job. Even you walk out there on the street and talk, about, talk to unbelievers, they probably know Job and his patience because that's how, um, that's how he's known, right? Um, so just like him. We may be walking through some things, and it's like, wow, I don't like this. This doesn't feel good. Um, I wish it would be taken off of me. I don't dig it. Whatever it is. And we may never find out, you know, why a, a specific thing happened. But, again, like we talked about with me and in, in my mouth, somebody from afar may be looking at you guys and say, wow, he's going through that, and he's behaving like that. What does he have that I don't have? And next thing you know, there's a conversation had that they get to ask you, why are you different than, than somebody else? One of the places I, that I think about this specifically from two angles is when somebody dies. Um, I don't know what you do without the knowledge of thinking that you'll never see your friend your wife, your mom, your dad, again. Um, 
just to think, I saw you today, you're gone, I won't ever see you again, seems pretty brutal. But if you go to, um, you know, I've been to a few here, and you see people who walk in, <coughs> walking through that, and they know they're going to see their, their dad again, their mom again, and there's mourning and there's sorrow there, but there's also excitement knowing that they're with Jesus and that one day they're going to go as well, and guess who they're going to get to see? They're going to get to see Jesus, and they're going to get to see their loved one that they, that they lost. And that's just another way, you know, which is why Pastor David, I think a few times other pastors have said, you know, certain times of life, funerals and things, are one of the greatest opportunities to win people. A, they're open, and B, I think they may have a lot of people to look about to say, wow, I want to be like that, I want to be like that, I want to be like that, I want to be like that. So. Now we're going to switch to talk about oaths, which we talked about just for a second, but it's verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, neither by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. The words of Jesus recorded in Matthew are clearly in mind of James as he writes verse 12. Matthew 5, 34 through 37 says, But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head because you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. I think he makes it pretty clear that yes is enough, no is enough. I found that um, that men and people in general um, who feel that their words won't be taken uh, seriously feel the need to add. It's like, oh, I promise, I pinky swear, I, I guarantee, um, you can count on it, yes, definitely, most definitely. Um, and kind of the same types of things with no. Um, and there's kind of a, a thing when, when somebody's telling you a fib, they just don't say no, it's no, and I'm going to give you five minutes of a story so I can make sure that you know that I'm telling you the truth when I said no, I didn't do such and so. Um, alarms should be going off when you hear that kind of stuff, because generally speaking, with, with lies and with, with embellishments of yeses and noes, um, those people have a believability issue. James's, James's instructions is what we should say, what we mean, and mean what we say. Our lives should um, back up the trustworthiness of our words. Kind of a couple other things that we talked about, it's, it's, a, um, it's a testimony thing. Let's be different. When we say yes, when we say no, mean it. Don't change. Um, not to say we can't ever because things happen, I get that, but... We can't be wishy-washy. We don't want to be, if the world is like that, and I think they are, um, we, don't want to, we don't want to go in that direction. We want to be different. Verse 13 through 18 talks about um, sickness, prayer, um, being patient in endurance of, of sickness. So verse uh, 13 reads, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Commit, confess your trespasses one to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I 
Notice in these, there's, there's two kind of situations or, or experiences that are thought here. One is um, affliction, and the other one is happiness. If you're afflicted, pray. If you're happy, sing psalms. The word psalms, translated, does not just refer to psalms as we read in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it refers to God's um, praises in a general sense. So when life is going along well, we should praise God. When life is taking a difficult path, we should pray to God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Often we take our problems to God while we remain silent when praise is due. Sometimes I wonder if God gets tired of hearing us pray when it's like, I need, give me, I'm sick, could you, could you hook me up, can you do me this, can you do me this solid, rather than just saying, Lord, don't need nothing right now, I just want to say, hey, and you're great, and thank you. Thank you for my breath, because that's a gift. Sometimes I wonder, um, the reason for that is the good times that we are having, we either expect them because we've been good boys and girls, and they're deserved because we've been good boys and girls, or um, it's primarily because of something we did, right? I knocked it out at work, my boss gave me a raise, yay me, rather than, Lord, Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for giving me a brain. Thank you for letting my boss even notice me, right? It's like Eeyore with somebody noticing his tail. You know, he's just happy he's got one. Kind of same thing. Um, don't have to be noticed. Specific to prayer um, and the sick. Recovery uh, for the sick begins with the sick person. The sick person must recognize that he is not independent of God, but rather is dependent on God. He too should pray. Elders are also at times called in. James instructs the afflicted person to call for those who have leadership positions in the assembly to come and pray over them. Prayer is not the anoint, uh, prayer, not the anointing, is the key. Healing would be the result of prayer and praying, not the anointing. Verse 13 says, let him pray, and then later it says, um, and the prayer of the faith shall um, save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Doesn't mention anointing there. Again, prayer is the key. Anointing with oils does have a purpose. In reading, I found um, three possibilities, um, or three uh, explanations. One is that oil is a medicine, or back in the day could have been medicine. Maybe, maybe not, um, but, um, but there's a couple others. Others say because oil is often symbolic of God's outward blessing, the application of oil is an exhibition of faith that God will restore the sick back to health. And there's a, another where in the Old Testament view, the anointing of oil was an act of identification. We're saying, we're identifying with Christ. I think there can be some reality to all three of those. You could argue, make argument for all three, I guess. Um, instant healing is not promised. While there is a promise of healing, there is no promise of instantaneous healing. God may choose to heal instantly, but he may also choose to heal over a period of time. Healing may be an obvious or a miraculous event, or it may include the hands of man. And then some would argue if it's the hands of man, is it miraculous? And I would say yes. Um, how do we get brains? Now, you could talk to scientists, and they would say the world, our stuff, goo exploded, or there was become goo, and then, but no, we've got brains, and just the, the, the things that we've discovered I mean, who's allowing us to, to do that? Um, 
So even, even the idea that we can have something to do in healing somebody else, to me, is, is miraculous. Maybe a little less, though, than saying a prayer. You go in, have cancer, come out after some prayer and don't have cancer. Oh, yeah, that's definitely miraculous. But again, I would argue that the fact that we can do things to each other and heal our bodies is, is pretty cool and a miraculous thing as well. For me personally, and I didn't get this, this just popped into my head. So there are some that pray, and I'm, gonna, I'm looking at my man Carson. Carson, man, he prays, and he just knows God's going to heal. It's done deal. Period. Done it. He claims it. Awesome. Don't disagree. I personally have a little trouble with that because I don't, I don't know how God works, right? Because you look and you pray sometimes and somebody doesn't get healed. And then you pray and somebody does get healed. Where does that work? I don't know. God says he heals. God says pray, he'll give healing. And then for me, there's a little safety net. As soon as I die, I'm healed. So whether it's this side of life or the other side, we all get healed. So, you know, and I call it a safety net. I don't mean to be sacrilegious or, or demean the healing. Um, but that just popped into my brain one day because I'm, I'm like, I'm praying, God, please heal this if it's your will, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, no way. First of all, I should have more faith in that. But the other side of that, even if God chooses not to heal on this side for some reason, as soon as you die, you're healed. Period. End of story. If you're a believer. So we're good. So pray for healing, right? In God's timing. And it will happen in God's timing. I didn't get that in any reading or whatever. That's just in my brain. So I may be, <laughs> I may be wrong. So there are some that believe uh, all sickness is the cause, or all sickness is the, is the result of sin. And I kind of look at that in two ways. One is yes, right? Because without original sin, be no sickness, we'd be good. So I'm going to put that off kind of on its own little place. Because um, I, I will say, yes, that's true. But the cold, the broken arm, the whatever, fill in the blank. Um, it may or may not be the result of sin. It may be a, make, a mechanism of God's chastening. Um, in these cases, um, chastening and even sickness would not be removed until it reached its desired effect, which is, guess what? Repentance. Confession. Um, of the sin. As we saw in verse 16, that would be the desired effect. This shows us that there may be both spiritual and physical healing. Don't assume sickness is always the result of sin. Even the disciples were asking Jesus about this, right? In John 9, 2 through 3, um, they were talking to him and they said, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. We might get sick just so kind of following theme of somebody... Yeah, to go back and look at, at that. But suffice it to say, right, kind of getting to the theme of, of walking in the workplace, getting sick, getting ill, right? Um, be it sin, be it God doing it so he can reveal himself, um, because God may want to use you in some disease and its cure to be a witness to somebody. So how did Jesus respond to them? Jesus answered, right? And so God could be revealed in that person. So God was going to use them as a testimony. And then the, the idea of mutual confession and prayer is discussed here in these as well. The context of use of the word trespass in verse 16 would seem to limit confession to those sins which had a particular effect on each other. 
So a good working principle for a confession of that type would be this. It should be no more widespread than the knowledge of the sin, but it should be as widespread as the knowledge of the sin. So in other words, those that need to be involved should be involved. Mutual confession is not a time, it's a time for prayer, um, not for gossip. And then verse 17 and 18 talks about prayer illustrated. James noted at the end of verse 16 that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I think another way to say this is the prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effect. God's going to listen to all of us, but I think there are, I mean, we hear the, the term prayer warrior, right, mentioned. I don't know if I'll ever hear that mentioned of me in my lifetime, sad to say, right? I pray, don't get me wrong, but I don't know that I would call myself a warrior, right? But I do know people, my wife, pray, and she'll pray, and she'll pray, and she'll pray, and she'll pray, um, which we have some running jokes when she's praying. I give her at the end, I give her some things just to add on to make it a little more lengthy. But, 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 but she, she's, people like her to pray because she's, when she prays, things happen. It's, I'm here because she prayed. Um, there's, there's people out there, intercessory prayer people. Um, there's powerful people out there with prayer. So that's, that's all this is, is saying. God listens to all of us. But, and I just think there's, there are certain people that are just, they're chasing God more and demanding, in not an ugly way, but demanding, Lord, I want to see this out of the other thing done in conjunction with your will. And they do that differently than somebody, again, that doesn't live in that space. I don't know that we're all called to pray. I don't know that we're all called to be intercessory prayers. I mean, we could probably argue that. Pastor Nick, you can tell me I'm wrong <laughs> after we're done. So... Um, but as we're, um, yeah, so because a righteous man's prayer will differ from others in that they're more fervent, they're more earnest, and they're, they can be more effective. We kind of look at Elijah, right, in 1 Kings 17 and 18. He had some earnest prayers. He said, Lord, I think it'd be cool if it didn't rain for three and a half years. Guess what? It didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he decided to pray again, and the heavens opened. At the very time he prayed, that same day, they opened. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I could pray for it to stop raining. It'd be kind of cool. So Elijah is a great example of patience and persistence in prayer, that, and regardless of the, uh, of the circumstance, when seeking the Lord in the mind Lord's mind in all manners. And then last, we have verses 19 and 20, just regards, in, in regards to counseling um, among the brethren. Verse 19, brethren, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So verse 20 is often assumed to be related to the conversion of a non-believer. While that may be the case, I think it also could be argued that the way that verse 17 starts, it shows that verse 20 is being directed at believers because it has the word brethren, if any among you wander from the truth. Um, a non-believer is not walking in the truth. They're apart from the truth. So these verses speak to the turning of a sinner, of, uh, of a sinning believer from sin, a backslider, if you will. He says, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, as he has, as he has saved that soul from death and, and has covered a multitude of sins. First, we see the, ones that, the one that needs to be turned around. The backslider is described as the one who has wandered off from the error in his ways. The person in error needs to um, 
He needs to be helped out by a fellow believer. Um, sometimes I think that's what church is about. Yes, we come here to hear God, hear from God, but sometimes we need to hear from God speaking on behalf of God to hit us upside the head and say, hey, why are you doing that? Come back this way. So second, we see the one who helps. This is the one that brings the counsel. James is referring to the loving concern that demonstrates itself by going out of one's way to reclaim, reclaim the erring brother. In Galatians 6, 1 and 2, Paul wrote, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a great spirit of gentleness, in one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. We should remember that one day, we too could be walking in our brother's shoes. And we may need that loving help from our brother, because today it's him, tomorrow it's me. Third, there is a result of rescue. The word soul here refers to a person's life, so the life is delivered from death, not hell. The word death may refer to an actual physical death, or it could just refer to loss. So James, this goes out in the weeds a little bit maybe, but James could be referring to the concept in 1 John 5, uh, 1 John 5, 16, and the sin, unto, the sin unto death, in which case he's talking about physical death. And if he's speaking, but if he's speaking about loss in general in this verse, he would be speaking about the concept of backsliding. When the back, with the backslider, there is loss of what that life may have achieved had it continued to walk in the way of truth. Fourth, there is a hiding of the multitude of sins. I think James wants us to understand the restoration of a backsliding brother is well worth the effort. We could hide a brother's sins in that as he returns to the truth, he no longer goes on sinning. Because he's not sinning, those sins he might have committed are hidden. But it also could be that the brother sins become hidden with return to truth as part of, so as part of his repentance process. James, as our example, cared about those he wrote to as individuals and was concerned with their relationship with each other. We, in some respects, are responsible for each other. Concern for our brother is part of the consistent faith, exhorting patience and endurance in the view of the Lord's return. And kind of to sum it up, riches we found won't save us. They'll condemn us potentially. Prayers can heal us and keep us on the path as we repent, um, as we ask for forgiveness, as we pray over each other for healing, and then as we just learned the counseling of one another can keep us on a path because sometimes we may on our own tend to err and wander and it's good to have a brother that can come alongside and lovingly tell you you're being a moron right now and get with the program and come on back.